sometimes you want a burger with fries. Sometimes a burrito will do. And some days, all you really want is a little bit of everything. Enchiladas, yes, thank you. Fried rice, orange chicken, a salad, perhaps, and a big old piece of pie. Perhaps cake, too. Yes, definitely cake, too. (laughs) Yes, sometimes only a buffet will do. And with our Internet of Things connected devices... We need a sensor all-you-can-eat buffet all of the time. We need options. We need specs. We need design considerations. We need soft serve with sprinkles. (laughs) Okay, wait, especially that last one. (laughs) Now, the more choices, the better, right? Because the wrong sensor choice can cause a ripple effect of issues later in everyone's project. Oh, man, don't get me started there. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. You better step right up, my friends, with your plate in hand, because Clint Briscoe from Honeywell and I are digging into a big old platter of sensors. And at the same time, hopefully we'll help you decide on what kind of pressure sensor you can use in your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find more information about pressure sensors from Honeywell. Hi, Clint. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, so when I think about Honeywell, I'm usually thinking about thermostats. Is that still the case? Well, I I think it's natural to think of thermostats when you think of Honeywell. You know, we've got a legacy on the thermostat side of the business that dates back to the late 1800s. In fact, our company was founded on control devices that control dampers in coal applications. You know, we've made millions of those devices even since the post-Civil War era. But when you think about it, statistically speaking, you are more likely to have a Honeywell thermostat in your home than any other type of thermostat. But While we do have a very established legacy on that thermostat business, which is why your mind would immediately go there, we do have an equally impressive legacy when it comes to sensing technology as well. We've got a very varied portfolio when it comes to our sensing technology. We do everything from make magnetic sensors all the way to creating very complicated, sophisticated sensors that go in military and aerospace applications. So when you think of Honeywell, I think it's important that you think beyond where you your mind would normally go when you think of thermostats. You should also think about the sensors that we bring to the table and whether you have a big project, a small project, a very simple project, or a very complicated project, that we probably have a sensor in our portfolio that's going to help you get your project done better and faster than just about any other sensor manufacturer on the market today. So you're talking about a really broad portfolio, but are there products that get more design activity than others where we can focus our attention? Yeah, I think for today, in terms of our conversation, while we do have a very broad portfolio, we want to focus on a series of sensors that get the majority of the design activity. So we're going to focus specifically on what we deem focus products. So these are the products where we see the most work, where we see the most design activity. So first and foremost is our micropressure sensor offering, which is our latest introduction. This is the smallest ported pressure sensor that's actually on the market today. This particular sensor is really going to be a game changer in not only the traditional medical and industrial space, but also in the consumer space. Next in our portfolio is our True Stability offering. The True Stability family is comprised of our TSC, our HSC, and the RSC. And this sensor family is our most accurate in the portfolio and is really used in applications where accuracy, stability, and resolution are king. And then lastly is our basic pressure sensor line, which is comprised of the TBP, the NBP, and the ABP. So prior to the introduction of micropressure, this was our entry-level basic pressure sensor. While it is no longer the entry-level product in our portfolio, it's still very cost competitive, and it offers specific configurations that really allow it to be uniquely successful in a variety of applications. Okay, let's start by talking about one of your most recent introductions. Yeah, so 
our most recent introduction, as we talked about a moment ago, is our micropressure offering. And our micropressure offering is really for us defined in five key ways. First and foremost is its compact design. The sensor itself comes in a five millimeter by five millimeter package, which means that it minimizes the space that's needed on a board, and it can really be easily incorporated into designs for small, lightweight products. Unlike a lot of sensors in this category, it also features a pretty wide pressure range. You'll see some competitive sensors that are on the market today that offer a handful of pressure options, but that's really it. But that isn't the case with our solution. Our solution also consumes very little power. This is really important in highly mobile battery-operated applications. Micropressure is also the smallest ported pressure sensor on the market today. Having a port is really a game-changer in the categories where we're competing specifically with this device. A port allows you as a designer to bring media to the sensor and then make connections via tubing to the sensor itself. With a lot of the other sensors that are on the market in this particular category, this just simply isn't the case and, and can't be done. And the lack of a port can oftentimes force design engineers to compromise their design or change their design entirely in order to accommodate for this. And then lastly, micropressure offers a digital output. A digital output is important because it keeps you from having to add an A to D to the board in order to convert an analog signal. So some of the other sensors that are out there in this category tend to offer an analog-only option while also promoting a very low cost. What they aren't telling you, or what they conveniently forget to tell you, rather, is that adding an A to D to the board can actually be quite expensive. So while you may be spending less on the sensor itself, in terms of the overall design cost, you may actually be spending more. So Clint, where will Honeywell be focusing most of your attention? You know, I think for not only Honeywell, but also for other sensor manufacturers, there's three categories where you're going to see a majority of the design activity as we move forward. And that's going to really be in the medical, the industrial, and really in the consumer spaces. And what we're showing here is the size of the markers represents the size of each market. So we'll talk about medical first. When you look at medical, this is a very stable market. It's also very slow to grow. So it's a very solid market. It's a market where we do a lot of business today, but it's just not the size of growing at the rate of some of the other categories. So for instance, when you look at the industrial category, it's really quite large in terms of overall size, and it's forecasted to see steady growth in the years ahead as well. So I would expect us, as well as other manufacturers, to be heavily focused here. And then also, as you may have imagined, the consumer category is currently the largest, and it's also going to grow at a very rapid pace as well. So it's going to see a lot of growth primarily due to the fact that consumer products are becoming smarter and more sophisticated than ever before. So because of this, expect to see us and others like us focusing in this category more than maybe what they have in the past. Okay, so you mentioned medical and consumer devices. I feel like I'm seeing CPAP machine ads all the time these days and hearing about sleep apnea more than ever. Do you have any sensors that can be used in that area? Sure, we absolutely have solutions that are in this space, and we see a lot of design activity when it comes to CPAP machines. It's important to remember, though, when you're designing for a CPAP machine, that these are very dynamic environments. You might not think so on the surface, but there are a lot of things that really should be considered. For instance, when you think of a CPAP machine, the machine itself is supplying cool, dry air that's being pumped through the tube into the mask. The patient, on the other hand, is exhaling or is breathing out warm, moist air that's going back into the tube. So what tends to happen when cool, dry air meets warm, moist air? You got it, condensation. So because condensation is such a common problem in these applications, you have to ensure that you're selecting a sensor that is moisture resistant. So in an attempt to reduce the overall cost of the product, what you'll see a lot of design engineers do is that they'll try to incorporate inferior sensors into the application by shielding the sensor or putting them near an element on the board, for instance, that might heat up. The idea here is to use the heat from that element to keep the sensor dry. 
Another approach that design engineers will oftentimes use is to incorporate traps or filters that will keep the condensation from making it to the sensor itself. The problem with both of those approaches, though, is that whether you're using heaters or traps and filters, you're always unnecessarily complicating the design of the actual device in order to make a sensor work that really isn't designed for the application. So not only are you complicating the design, but most of the times these workarounds also add cost. So I think we've all seen more and more CPAP machines than maybe we have in the past. Think back to CPAP machines of old 15 or 20 years ago. These tended to be very large pieces of equipment that sat on a bedside table and tended to be largely immobile. The mobility of these devices was really emphasized for me on a recent trip. As I went through TSA, I encountered a guy who was pulled by security off to the side so that they could inspect a small bag. And as TSA inspected it, it turned out that it was a CPAP machine. As we become more mobile, the need for smaller, more mobile devices is becoming obviously more important. And to accommodate these smaller designs, what do you need? You need smaller components. You need fewer components in some instances to be able to support this type of behavior or activity. So being mobile also means not always being near a dedicated power source. So a shorter battery life means the user or the patient in some cases can only go as far as the device will actually allow them to go. Lastly, when you think about CPAP machines, you have to think about moisture control. We talked about that earlier, but this goes well beyond just protecting the sensor itself. A lack of moisture control also leads to sanitation issues. As we talked about, these have lots of condensation. That condensation really creates a situation where you can have mold or mildew growth, and if you have those build up in this type of device, it can have some serious health implications as well. Okay, let's talk about a really common application like HVAC. What are you guys seeing in this area? Well, no, you're absolutely right. HVAC applications are very common. They are today driven heavily by sensor technology and have been for quite some time. A common use for pressure sensors is to use actual pressure sensors to measure airflow that runs through the ductwork itself and then use that point of measurement of the flow to control the dampers throughout the system. So with this type of approach, the system is designed to be able to direct fresh heated or cooled air to the areas of the building that need it while keeping it away from areas that simply don't. So to accomplish this, it's critical to ensure that you're choosing a sensor from a design perspective that is not only accurate at installation, but one that will not drift over time. So when sensors drift in this type of application, what you tend to see is that the system itself will sense flow when no air is moving, or it will believe the opposite of that and think that no air is moving when the system is fully operational. In both of those scenarios, neither one is really ideal. A sensor that's not accurately detecting airflow is actually one of the top generators for callbacks when it comes for HVAC professionals. The other key area to consider for HVAC applications as well is the ease of use when you're connecting a sensor. So uh, I think that we've all seen an HVAC professional's hands. They tend to be very dainty and nimble. I'm kidding, of course. These professionals work very hard. Their hands tend to tell you how hard they work. So when you're creating your devices or your sensing technology, and specifically the boards and the sensors that will mount to those boards, you need to take into consideration who's actually going to be working on this equipment. So making delicate connections to very small components can be very difficult, even for people with very small, dainty hands. But when you have professionals that work hard every day, you need to make sure that you're supplying a device that will be easy to connect, that they can connect very quickly, and they can be on to the next task or even the next job. Now, when you think about the challenges that face HVAC applications, these are really very simple and focus almost exclusively around reliability of the system itself and specifically the reliability of the system as it relates to the warranty period. So remember, in the HVAC category, just about every unit that goes out the door is going to have the manufacturer's name boldly stamped on the side of that piece of equipment. 
So when it comes to warranty claims or when it comes to dissatisfaction, the customer is absolutely going to know who they need to contact and who they need to call. So for these types of applications, choosing a sensor that is accurate is paramount. That's pretty easy to understand. So as we discussed, you know, you want to make sure that you are creating a system that's able to accurately determine what's happening in the environment. And you want to make sure that you have components in the system that will survive the warranty period. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, the system has to prevent service calls or claims, plain and simple. Every call for a service is expensive. Not only does it cost the manufacturer in replacement parts, But it also costs the manufacturer as well as service professionals a lot of money when it comes to labor expenses, transportation costs, and just general overhead. All right, Clint, let's go a little less traditional. Show me some fun consumer devices. Yeah, so let's talk about a couple of those. Let's talk about coffee makers. So coffee makers use a variety of sensors, but we're going to talk about two primary sensors that these devices are really using today and that play a critical role when it comes to brewing that perfect pot of coffee. The first sensor in a coffee maker that we'll talk about is really used to monitor three different areas. First is brew pressure, then it is there to detect faults, and then thirdly is there to sense altitude. So let's talk about each one of those. So this particular sensor ensures that the brew pressure used is the same every single time the machine is used. You don't want to have a cup of coffee that tastes good one day and tastes bad the next. So it's really important to make sure that you have something that's consistent so that you can rely on getting that perfect cup of coffee every single morning. This sensor also senses whether or not there is a fault in the system. So think about individual brew makers. You could have a crushed cup that's still in the coffee maker itself, so it would detect that. You could have an individual serving cup or a pod that wasn't completely perforated, so you would want to know about that as well. So it would generate a fault to let you know that there was some sort of error in the brewing process. But maybe most importantly, and oftentimes overlooked or not even known, is that the sensor detects altitude. So think about a coffee machine manufacturer. When they have a coffee machine that comes off the end of the line, it could go to Denver, Colorado. It could go to New Orleans, Louisiana. The altitude in both of those locations is vastly different, and the manufacturer wants the machine to ensure that the perfect cup of coffee is brewed no matter where it is in the world. So that's where that particular sensor really is of critical importance. Now, the second sensor that we want to talk about that's in this particular system is used to measure the water level. So that's also really important as well, because knowing how much water is in the system is of critical importance, because if you have too little water in the system, it'll limit how much coffee can be made, or in some cases it may cause the pot or the cup to be overly concentrated. On the flip side of that, not knowing how much water is in the system may also lead the user to actually overfill the system itself, which in some cases could create a painful and sometimes even dangerous overflow situation. Now, there are also common challenges that you have to think about in coffee maker applications as well. Although coffee machines are not the most complicated devices, they tend to be relatively straightforward, there are some things that you should absolutely keep in mind. First and foremost, a sensor that has a detection range is very important because as we mentioned, these systems frequently use a single sensor to detect a variety of conditions. So you want to make sure that you've got a sensor that is capable of detecting those conditions across a full range. These machines also require a sensor that's accurate over that full range. So accuracy is important over range as well. So another common consumer application that we run into quite a bit are washing machines and dishwashers. So with coffee machines, as we established, one of the most important elements to making that perfect cup of coffee is water. Well, what's the most important element when you're washing clothes or you're washing dishes? Obviously, it's water. So the key with using water in a washing machine or a dishwasher application is making sure that you're using the right amount. So water efficiency is very important. So you need to make sure that you're using just enough to clean your dishes or in some cases if it's a washing machine, your clothes. 
but also not so much water that you're actually wasting that resource. So think about the areas of the country that this summer have experienced drought or even fire conditions and put that into perspective about how vital it is to maximize your water usage. So although water is critical in cleaning dishes or clothes, you don't want to supply so much of it that the appliance floods the house either. So legacy equipment, specifically when you're thinking about dishwashers, has often used a float switch. In some cases, these float switches can be defeated. So that creates, obviously, a natural flooding situation. By the same token, as dishwashers have moved to sensors, sensors that are not ideally suited for these types of applications can present problems as well. Because if you're putting a sensor in this application that's not designed for a dishwasher or washing machine application, but you're using it in order to hit a cost position, it could create long-term problems for you as well. In both situations, obviously selecting a sensor that's accurate can go a long way to not only addressing your water efficiency, but also making sure that you're not creating a flooding situation as well. Now, when you think about common challenges in this type of application, specifically with dishwashers, it's really important to think beyond just the compatibility of the sensor with water because there's more in this application than just H2O. You know, unfortunately, soap that's often used in these applications can be incredibly destructive to sensors. So selecting a sensor that will not only stand up to the water, but will also stand up to the other materials that are going to be used in these applications will ultimately ensure your success as well. The sensor also needs to be accurate after offset. So it should really go without saying that in a dishwasher application, if you don't have an accurate, reliable sensor, that's really a problem that's waiting to happen. So the machine needs to be able to not only accurately detect the water level and supply water when needed, but it needs to also shut off water when that water is no longer required. Okay, so, so far we've talked about some of the smaller board mount pressure sensors, but can we move on to some sensors that handle more robust applications? Yeah, sure, absolutely. We have a collection of pressure sensors. So when it comes to pressure, we really run the gamut in terms of applications that we're able to address, pressure ranges, connection types, outputs, you name it. Our product portfolio when it comes to heavy-duty pressure products is also so equally diverse. But just like with the board mount pressure products, we're going to focus on what we deem to be our focus products. So we're going to take a look specifically at four of those products. And these are the products where we see the most design activity, not only currently, but where we forecast most of the design activity to take place as we move forward. So first and foremost is MIPS. This is actually a product that you're getting a sneak peek at today. It's set to launch later this year. This particular product is going to be media ice isolated, so it will give you broader media compatibility. But even though it's going to be media isolated, it is going to be priced to sell. So it will be targeted at some of those higher volume consumer type applications where price is, is really going to rule the day. Next is our PX3. So this particular sensor was created with HVAC and R applications in mind. This particular sensor does give you the capability to address almost any HVAC application. Next is the PX2. So the PX2 is one of the most configurable products that we have in our overall product portfolio. You will also see this used in HVAC applications, and you could also see it used in transportation applications as well, whether that be with air brakes or oil pressure monitoring. And then lastly is our Jay-Z Stainless product. Jay-Z Stainless features a stainless steel construction, which allows it to be used in a variety of applications and allows it to come in contact with a variety of media as well. So this particular sensor is very robust and has a great deal of flexibility because of its overall construction and the media that it can come in contact with. Okay, let's talk about MIPS first. Yeah, sure. So this is a product that we will launch later this year. And there are a couple of key things about this particular product that are important to keep in mind. First and foremost is its media compatibility. So this particular sensor is going to be media isolated and it will have a stainless steel diaphragm. So that's really important because it's going to give this particular sensor the ability to interact with media that other sensors in this space and even some other sensors in our product portfolio simply haven't been able to do before. 
So it will give it more flexibility from an application standpoint than what a lot of design engineers are really accustomed to. It will also be rated for operating in both very hot and very cold climates. That's important with heavy-duty pressure transducers or heavy-duty pressure sensors because there are applications that will not only have a broad operating range, but there are also applications where you could be in very cold or in very warm environments or applications. So really having the flexibility to address both is going to be very important. These types of sensors also often experience or are exposed to high burst pressures. Some of the other sensors that are on the market today simply can't accommodate some of those burst pressures. So when those types of situations occur in those applications, those other sensors experience damage or can fail entirely. So it should go without saying, if it is able to stand up to high burst pressure, it can tolerate heat and cold. This particular sensor is also built tough. So not only is it built to withstand those particular conditions, but it is built to withstand shock and vibration. And also when it comes to HVAC applications, it can also survive uh, freeze-thaw cycles. So that's really important as well. All of those things together really help make this pressure sensor be able to attack a variety of applications. So that's why we refer to it as really a jack of all trades. No longer do you have to select a particular sensor for a specific application. This sensor gives you the ability to address a variety of applications with a single sensor platform so that you can really maximize your flexibility with how you're going to attack those applications. So Clint, where do you see this operating in the medical space? So, you know, one of the common areas where we would see sensors like these heavy-duty pressure sensors operating is in ventilators and anesthesia machines. So when it comes to these types of machines, some of the things that you should really be thinking about is first and foremost is accuracy. Think about going into a surgical procedure. How many people want to go into a surgical procedure when the medical professionals that are on hand have no idea how much material or medication is in the tank that they're relying on. I would venture to bet nobody wants to be in that particular situation. So making sure that you have a sensor that is accurate goes a long way to making sure that when these medical procedures take place, that there is 100% certainty around the level of medication that is currently in the tank and whether or not there is enough in that tank to successfully conduct the procedure that's going to take place. The other thing that you have to think about as well, though, is media compatibility. Now, a lot of the gases that pressure sensors in this category will come in contact with will be inert. Typically, there will be no problems there. When it comes to anesthesia and some other medications, though, those can be actually quite corrosive and can negatively impact the sensor. So not only can it impact the sensor by impacting its overall accuracy, but in some cases it can cause the sensor to fail. So it's really important that in these applications you're choosing a sensor that can withstand the media that's going to monitor and that it's going to be accurate over time as well. Now, when you think of common design challenges, just like with some of the board mount pressure sensors, we talked quite a bit about how people are becoming more mobile and there's a need for reduced size and increased mobility. You also see that happening with these types of applications as well. So when you think about design challenges, some of the same design challenges in the medical application for heavy duty pressure are the same as we talked about and that we saw in the board mount pressure applications as well. Primarily where size is becoming more and more important and where mobility is increasing in importance as well. So when you think about traditional medical applications, you tend to think of using this type of equipment in your standard OR or operating setting. Fortunately, that's no longer the case. You see these machines being needed in outpatient rooms, standard patient rooms, or even in mobile applications like in ambulances or even in helicopters. So while there is a move on the consumer side, consumer medical, to shrink product to match the mobile lifestyle of people today, there's also a growing trend to shrink the overall size in traditional 
medical applications as well. It should also go without saying that in medical applications, reliability continues to be incredibly important. So when you think about reliability, you want to specifically think about how many cycles can this particular sensor withstand? Will it experience drift? Obviously, you don't want to have that. And you want to make sure that you're choosing a product that will be able to service the full lifespan of the product. In most medical applications, that tends to be 10 years or more. Okay, so what about in the industrial sphere? What if I want to monitor pressure within the system itself? Yeah, so just like with medical applications, there being a need for board mount pressure as well as heavy-duty pressure on the medical side, the same thing can be said in HVAC applications. While in the HVAC applications, you typically don't have heavy-duty pressure and board mount pressure sensors monitoring for the same things, there is a need for these types of sensors in different parts of these systems. So specifically when it comes to heavy duty pressure sensors, what you have to think about when you're designing these sensors in is that a lot of times they are going to be measuring the pressure within the system itself. And these systems can oftentimes be very demanding environments. So it's not uncommon when we look at our heavy duty pressure sensors to see oftentimes them encased in ice. You have to think about where these pressure sensors are being used. Sometimes they can be on a rooftop. So think about a sensor like this being on a rooftop in Phoenix, Arizona with super cooled Freon running through the system and it's 100 plus degrees outside. What tends to happen is you get condensation. That condensation can freeze and over time can encase the sensor in ice. Well, there are also periods where that sensor would thaw and then it would freeze again and then it would thaw and then it would freeze. And so a lot of sensors are not really tested or made to withstand that type of punishment. That constant freeze-thaw cycle can create a lot of problems for most sensors, primarily where you would get water ingress that would impact the overall reliability of the sensor. The other thing that you want to think about and that you have to take into consideration is, again, accuracy. I know we've talked a lot about accuracy in a variety of applications, but accuracy is of critical importance in this particular setting as well. Because if you have a machine that is working when it really shouldn't be, that's going to turn the dial on the meter more times than it will less. Every time that dial turns, it costs money. So if you've got a sensor that is unreliable and it's causing the equipment to work more than it should, it's costing that owner or the operator of that equipment to pay more than what they really should as well. So you want to make sure that you have an accurate sensor because at the end of the day, it's all about money. So when you think about common design challenges in these particular applications, again, you have to think about media compatibility. There is a variety of media that could be monitored in these type of applications. And you want to make sure that you've got a sensor that is compatible with the media that it's going to come in contact with. Again, you want to make sure that you've got a sensor that is robust in terms of freeze-thaw resistance so that if it is going to be in those types of settings that it can handle that type of punishment. Insulation resistance is something that many people don't think about. But when you've got a sensor that's in these types of applications, you want to make sure that it is as safe as possible for people who are trying to either install the sensors or work on the sensor or service the equipment when it comes time to do that. Another thing that we're seeing in this category is the amount of communication that is taking place not only within this system, but within systems around the HVAC system. You want to make sure that you have a sensor that has a good EM position because you don't want to have interference not only from the HVAC equipment, but also the other equipment in the area that might impact the overall performance of the sensor. Now, we don't often think about leak detection, but that can be critical, right? That's an excellent point. When it comes to leak detection, it's oftentimes out of sight, out of mind. We don't think about it because these tanks that we're monitoring for leaks could be buried underground or they might be in remote areas where we don't typically come in contact with them or we're not looking at the dial on them to see exactly what's going on with that piece of equipment. So leak detection 
does become critical because we want to make sure that we're able to quickly and efficiently identify when we have a problem so that we can make sure that we address that. Like some of the other applications that we've talked about, media compatibility is very important because if you don't have media compatibility in this application, you may actually have a sensor failure, which would lead you to not be able to detect that you actually have a problem when you do have a problem. You also want to make sure that you have a system that has good sealing integrity. If the sensor itself is not able to withstand the pressure or the application and there is a failure in the sensor itself, the tank may not be leaking but you may actually be leaking out of the sensor. So you want to make sure that you have a sensor that's going to be able to withstand that so the sensor doesn't become the problem rather than the tank being the more common problem. The other thing that you want to think about in these applications when it comes to design challenges, though, is you want to think about the sensor location. We talked about these being out of sight, out of mind. They can be buried. When they're buried, they can be difficult to get to. They can be hard to work on. They may be in remote locations. They may be in locations that are exposed to weather, so rain, cold, heat. You want to make sure that you're choosing a sensor that's going to work for where the application is located. It also needs to have a sensor that is stable and that is accurate over time. It does you no good to have a sensor that works on the first day, but that doesn't work on the second day. Lastly, you want to make sure that you're choosing a sensor or considering a sensor based on the connection type. So we have customers that connect these types of sensors in a variety of ways. We'll have some sensors that want to simply thread them in and tighten them with tools. We have some people that want to weld these sensors into place. So those can present some individual challenges when you're selecting a sensor because you want to make sure that you're getting a sensor that is going to meet the needs for how you want to connect these sensors to the devices that they'll be monitoring. And leak detection is also relevant in the transportation space as well. Right, Clint? Yeah, leak detection is relevant in the transportation space, but there are different things that you have to consider in the transportation space than maybe in some of the other leak detection applications that we've discussed previously. So what you have to primarily consider when it comes to transportation is reliability and efficiency. So when it comes to reliability, you want to make sure that these are fully operational and that they are working. Because if they're not working, bad things can happen. How many people would want to be in front of an 18-wheeler that has a problem with their air brake system? Probably not very many. You want to make sure that you've got a sensor that is able to reliably communicate what's going on with the system and be able to alert the operator if there is a problem so that they can immediately try to address it. The other thing that you want to keep in mind, though, is the overall efficiency of the system. Because if the air brake system thinks that there is a problem and it begins to run more, it starts to consume more gas. So as it consumes gas, the overall efficiency of the system goes down because you're having to fill up more, which costs the operator more money. So it's very important to make sure that you have a sensor that is reliable and that you also have a sensor that's going to maximize efficiency. So when you're thinking about air brake applications or transportation applications, it's important to consider four primary design challenges. First and foremost is the cycle life because you want to make sure that you're selecting a sensor that is going to withstand the cycle life of the product itself. Secondly, you want to make sure that you've got good ingress protection. These sensors are exposed to the element. So they see snow, ice, rain, splash, frost. So you want to make sure that you've got something that's robust and that's able to withstand that type of punishment. But speaking of punishment, you also want to have a sensor that in this application is able to withstand the vibration that not only takes place with the rig itself, but that will also take place within the actual system as it's under operation. And then lastly, you want to make sure that you've got a sensor that's able to withstand and the temperature extremes that these types of trucks can oftentimes see. You could have the same truck be in Anchorage, Alaska, and then in two weeks, it could be in Miami, Florida. So these trucks travel long distances. They see lots of temperature swings and climate changes. So you want to make sure that you've got a sensor that is robust enough to be able to address every single one of those. Well, this has been a lot to cover today. Can you recap your main points for me? Yeah, so I think what's really important is when you think about Honeywell, 
and you think about some of the introductions that we have, whether it's micropressure or MIPS, which we introduced to you today, that you know we continue to really expand our overall portfolio. And although we have a legacy in the pressure category, that we're continuing to bring new products to market that are going to change the game in this particular category for years to come. So whether you're in a medical and an industrial or in a consumer application, we're probably going to have a sensor that's going to meet your needs. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Clint. Yeah, thanks for having me. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find more information about pressure sensors from Honeywell. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. Can't miss it right across the top. Or check out YouTube, keyword EE Journal.